continue, first I want to tell you about in the setup I'm giving you that uh, very parallel to the classical setting, how you can translate things from over C, from over C to over Q. All right. So basically it's by this picture down here. And if you have actually a rational number, if star is one over an integer equals one to a character of that order. And likewise, if, if you have a pair of uh, rational numbers, a, B with the same denominator, they can be correspond to um, multiplicative characters for the fixed one, eta M. Okay, let me see. Yeah, you're trying to, okay, yeah. Then raise to different powers. And the X to the A can cor correspond to A, the multiplicative character applied to X. And X to the A plus B can be translated into two characters a b applying to x and then minus a will be the inverse of multiplicative character a and gamma a is correlate to gauss sum of a and the rising factorial or pot hammer symbol you can define a seminal notion and the beta function correspond to the jacobi sum and on the complex case, we often see the inductive formula, there is integration from zero to one, and it can correspond to the submension formula on the right-hand side. And it was mentioning that the refraction formula will be translating into the corresponding kind of uh, formulation. And if A is not the trivial character, then you know the absolute value from the refraction formula. And more amazingly, the multiplication formula, if you write in terms of the rising factorial, they are actually very analogous formula. So using the setup and this kind of the analog, a lot of classical formula can be translated. Right. And I would like to, <laughs> I skip this, but I would like to come back that for some histories of the have a geometric functions over finite fields. Cats actually starting uh, kind of in the whole book about such kind of l edit version of what the uh, Boykers and Hetman's done over the actually finite field settings. And then based on his work, there is the development by Boykers, Fritz Boykers, Cohen and Anton Manick. And my colleague, um, Jerome Hoffman and two, they actually based on the rigidity of cats develop transformation formulas. And the other development, it's along the more like the, what I'm telling you, the correspondence between uh, classical and finite field setting is given by John Green and Evans, Ron Evans. So they are, John Green's version was used in a few paper of Ken Ono and Scott Elgren and proving one of the super conjectures made by Boykers. And then there are a modified version of John Green's by McCarthy later. And for what I have been talking about, it's a variation of John Green's version so that I put into the setting, which is more parallel to the classical case. So this is a joint work with uh, my co-authors Jenny Fuseli, Ravi Ramakrishna, Holly Swisher, and Fanting Tu. And let me go back to where I stop. So I was talking about the, this example, the vertical point of view. And I would like to actually mention this formulation in terms of Gauss sum. For following the work of actually McCarthy, Boykers, Cohen, and many. Essentially, this formulation, which what they use, or what we actually trying to kind of write down the convention over here is we put the size of the finite field down here. Alpha set, beta set now will be two multi set of rational numbers. So we go back to yesterday's lecture. Alpha will be a collection of A1, 
a m which are rational numbers and the same thing for beta and we let m to be the lcd the least positive common denominators of alpha beta and then there is another variable coming in lambda okay we can keep it or we can not using it but the assumption will be as long as this is a given number if it divides q minus one which is the finite field size take away one then in this assumption q minus one times aj and q minus one times bj for all the i and j will become integers okay then we are going to write down the hq function now depending on the choice of the multiplicative character for the finite field once you fix the choice of this omega over here you can write down the corresponding gauss sum for the ai and then for the bj what you do is there is uh, some negation going on for the bj a priori they go to the denominator but the convention they adopted which is more or less following cat's work is doing the refraction so the bj also go to the top and this is actually a formulation using purely in terms of Gaussian. And the good thing now is universally, I have alpha and beta set, which is global. As long as you're looking at finite fields whose size satisfying the property is divisible by M. And depending on which omega I'm going to pick, we are going to write down a formula for HQ. And to make our life easier, we write down also notice that in comparison, if alpha beta forming a primitive pair means AI minus beta AI minus BJ are not integers. For all IJ, this is the notion for alpha beta forming a primitive pair, then the HQ function and our normalized finite field version using explicitly those characters they will be exactly the same all right so you do not have to worry i introduce something dramatically different so in the primitive case it's the same as the normalized version and when alpha beta are defined over q let me see okay i did skip another page over here all right so when alpha beta defined over Q, this formulation can be actually turned into something a little bit better looking and more convenient to compute. And let me give you the motivation actually for the complex setting. So in this example, I'm giving you alpha will be one third, two third, which is defined over Q and beta to be one one. And notice that if I'm actually combine together these three rising factorial together so if for k which is a uh, integer greater or equal than zero by using multiplication formula by three we have this relation that one third k rising factorial k two third k one k you get to one three k with a power three to the front so with this notation, if I'm going to go to 2f1, 1, 1 third, 2 third, 1, lambda, by definition, I'm using those rising factorials. And if I'm adding 1k, which is a k factorial down here and another k factorial down here, I can use this formula to plug that inside here so that I turn this hypergeometric function into a formulation. Everything on this coefficient becoming integral in the sense that it's nothing but 3k factorial over k factorial, k factorial, k factorial, absorbing the three power into the parameter. So this is the idea. If I go to the finite field setting, we can turn something, the HP function into something which is going to be integral, right? So the, to continue in general, the way you do it is you look at alpha j, beta j, if they're defined over q, you first compute a ratio. So let me do this computation over here. So this means I'm going to take a, on the top, it's x minus the cubic root of three. 
times x minus cube root of three square correspond to one third and two third. Down here is one one, so it's x minus one, x minus one. So I get to x squared plus x plus one and x minus one square. And then I'm going to get something, everything in terms of a pure power. So I'm going to add another copy of x minus one to the denominator and numerator, I get to this version. And now it's going to be of the form x to a power, integer power minus one over x raised to different integer powers. So in this notation, we see that uh, on the top R, I only use one copy of such a kind of uh, special polynomial. And down here, I use three copies. And then P1 is going to be three. And then Q1 equals to Q2 equals to Q3 is going to be one, All right? So which is actually the same kind of computation relating to this formulation down here. And once we use that kind of the convention, if we go back to the definition here, it also depends on omega. Let's forget about that for a moment. Then use multiplication formula for the Gauss sums. You can turn things all of a sudden. Originally, it depends on whether this choice is going to be integer. All of a sudden, it turns into a formulation. It doesn't depend on the AI. BJ with suitable multiple to be integer anymore. So the advantage from the first version up here, you depends on whether Q minus one is divisible by the least common denominator. But the version down here is no longer depends on that. So it works as long as Q is co prime to M. As long as Q is co prime to M, you have this formulation. Okay. So this is actually kind of the, um, in the work by uh, Fritz Boykers, um, Cohen and Manet, they turn the formula HQ function from the normalized period function into something, which all of a sudden you can compute for almost all the finite fields, right? In particular, in uh, this notation over here, there's some sign coming from the refraction formula, and then there are some powers, which is very explicit. This power in the previous case is three to the minus three. It's a three to the three, and then you take the reciprocal down here. All right, so it's a very explicit power coming from the computation in the previous page is how you write down um, a priori, the rational function into a preferred form. And then there are some multiplicities. The multiplicities is regarding X minus a particular root of unity and the multiplicity of that inside the GCD of the denominator and numerator. For instance, if I check what's the multiplicity of x minus one, so when n is going to be zero, in the previous case, I have sq minus one, which is the numerator, I have x one to the three in the denominator, so the GCD is going to be x minus one. So when m is going to be zero, it's going to be one for the example. Otherwise, it's going to be zero. All right. So that's why if we go back to the previous example, you can write down HQ function. Now we'll work for all the Q P power as long as it's copine to three. You can write it down in the following formulation. And in comparison, is the finite field analog, this formula down here, all right? So again, I want to emphasize by using multiplication formula, the magic will be turning something a priori only defined for a fraction of kind of uh, finite fields into almost all. So you can generalize the finite field definition from a fraction to almost all. And then, of course, the definition when alpha, beta are defined over Q. Any questions here? It's a little bit technical, but the spirit will be using the multiplication formula 
you can turn things starting from which is fractional kind of notation into something which is integral. So from this notation is fractional and down here it's integral. So it's independent of the choice of one third and two third, all right? And once you refer to one third, two third, still in the background, you need characters of order three that require the base field to be one modulo three. Okay. Any questions? All right. Hopefully. Yeah. So we got to here. And now the question becomes, yeah, I have actually purely by multiplication formula, we can generalize the formula into the setting when alpha beta defined over Q, and you can write down this formulation, which is almost for all the prime power, you can do it. And, but the, naturally you will ask whether the generalization is geometric, all right? So this is actually referring to, if you say gamma, the PID gamma function one quarter, all right? And of course, it's actually geometric when P is going to be one more four. <laughs> it's relating to somehow the CN values of CN elliptic curve for some P values. But if you're doing the extension to P to be three more four, this value, I mean, this value is algebraic, I would just say that. But for P to be three more four, the story is different, all right? So this basically, this question is asking, will we facing the situation? I'm generalizing something, yeah, gamma P one quarter, P can be one or could be three, but geometrically it makes sense. It's, it's algebraic when P is going to be one more four, but it's not the case when P it's going to be three more four, all right? And the answer is, in the current setting, don't worry, it's going to be fine, right? It's going to be point counts, all right? The point counts, according to uh, the paper for Boyker's, uh, Cohen, and Minnick, the answer is they actually come up with some toric varieties, which is actually originating in Kat's work. They will, they gave you a recipe for write down two equations. So you should consider everything, um, all the X and Y to be invertible elements in the finite field. The first equation is, you depends on how many uh, R and S. So in a previous example, I computed R to be one, S to be three, for the case of one third, two third to be alpha and beta to be one, one. You write down, X, there is only one copy. And then you, there are three copies of Y, you subtract them. So the first equation is innocent. And then the second equation is going to be, depends on this is going to be the integer you computed from the powers of P and Q, right? In particular, in this case, it's going to be uh, M to be, all right, so this is, uh, three to the three over here, and I mess up with that inverse over here. And then there's a lambda, this is now the base parameter, and then you let your formal variable x1 raised to p1, so in the example is x1 to the three, and then you have the powers of y, I use capital y1, y2, and y3. You can write down a variety, All right? So this is a toric variety. And then I should move this minus one up here. And then, so what? They said that you can do in a toric compatification for this particular variety, and then you're doing the point counts, right? So as long as this product is not one, there exists a non-singular compatification of this toric variety so that for the given compatification, when you do the point count of the compatified model over finite fields, for almost all the finite fields, as long as it's co-prime to the LCM, then the number of solutions is going to be a power, a very explicit power of Q. So right, you have some Q powers coming in 
And then the major term here will be the HQ function. All right. The HQ function for the cases when alpha, beta defined over Q, they are actually rational numbers. So it's independent of the choice of omega. Okay. And then in addition, there are some power of Q might be coming into the picture. <laughs> so, um, if, yes. I, if I may just jump in here for a moment, if you stare at this formula for a second, you'll notice that this P R S of Q, basically it's a sum of powers of Q. Right. I mean, if you wrote it out mm -hmm. in terms of Q, yeah, and it's a power of Q. Yes. Right. Now, the, the point is, cohomologically, that means that those things are just Tate twists in various dimensions, cohomologically. Mm -hmm. And then you have one interesting dimension. It's the middle dimension of that variety. And in that middle dimension, you have a Tate twist times your important thing. OK, so this is the structure of the thing. This is what a smooth variety, well, it, it, it says that the smooth variety is very trivial cohomologically. It, it looks, looks like a bunch of Tate twists in various dimensions. I mean, and then, or Tate modules or whatever you want to call them. But in the middle dimension is all the action and it's a Tate twist times that guy. Mm -hmm. All right, that's just my comment. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, what I want to share as well. So in the end, the important pieces of the point counts is coming into this picture over here. It tells you this is a global kind of counting. Right? So the generalization does make good sense. It right? corresponds to um, the very particular kind of variety, which is very explicit. And I should mention another page I skipped is obviously from the definition for the P function when we defined it we can count points which is very analogous to the Legenda curve, right? So we can count points on curves of this kind, or we can actually make it to be more complicated variety as long as it matches with the period function. So that has been done in my joint paper with Jenny and Ravi, uh, Holly and Fountain, right? That page got kind of skipped as well. Okay, let me do it this way. And now I'm actually asking my question, are there one parameter families? I mentioned now two families. One is more or less like the Legenda curve. All right, this is one kind of algebraic varieties when we do the point count. Naturally, it's correlated to the period function and hence to the normalized period function. And the other kind, so this is the Thai one, Thai two, when alpha beta defined over Q, they are actually relating to uh, point counts on varieties of that kind. And I'm asking myself, are there any one parameter family of algebraic varieties? What I want will be their pick up with equations are uh, hypergeometric. If I see such a variety, then I will expect my point count over finite field. I mean, the finite field version might be applying to those formulas as well. All right, so we are actually hoping everything is coming in a compatible system. Right? So in the literature that uh, there is, a, especially in the business of mirror symmetries originating in string theory, they do use very particular kind of hypersurfaces. So they actually use, this is Fermat type hypersurface, but with a one parameter deformation. So without the last part, it's a Fermat type hypersurface with a deformation, one parameter deformation. And this is going to be the, the pickup foot is going to be hypergeometric. It's one of the very well-known CLAB BL34 because everything here by the setup is in P4 with one equation. So it's three-dimensional. It's uh, the well-known Clabial quintic surface. And the pickup of equation, you can compute different way. One way is called uh, the walk griffiths method. The other one, which is more computorial, is called the GKZ method. Then you know that the pickup of equation, one of the pickup of equation is going to be hypergeometric. 
The alpha parameter turns out to be one fips, two fips, three fips, and four fips, which is defined over Q. The lower parameter to be all ones. And the other example I'm giving you a priori is sitting in CP5 because I use uh, in projected space, I use six variables and I have two equations. So there is another threefold which is given by two equations. So it's a complete intersection. Okay. And the corresponding um, pick up with differential equation is also hypergeometric. The alpha parameter corresponds to one third, two third, one third, two third, defined over Q, and then there's a one, one, one. And uh, interestingly, just like what we have computed in the previous example, then the, in the differential equation, what they use is actually a power of the base parameter psi over here, and the same story happened down here. Okay, so um, as kind of number theorists, then we will ask ourselves, do we know the point counts, how it's relating to the finite field version that we brought up so far, okay? So let's get to the Dewalt family, which is actually in a very important paper by Dewalt. He computed things on such a family, which later called the Dewalt family, right? And depends on the degree. He computed the case for four in particular. So the Dewalt family, when the degree will be three, it's going to be a family of elliptic curve. It's also known as the pencil, Hessel pencil. N to be three is going to be a family of elliptic curve. Four, it's a family of K3 surfaces with generic pickup number 19. And to be five is the quintic clabial sleeveful. I would like to mention that because now this is a something in the business of mirror symmetries. So for this clabial sleeveful, I'm going to show you the hash numbers later. It has a differential three, so in, in general, it's going to be have a, diff, a minus two dimensional variety for a generic, uh, the Watt family. And then there is a kind of normalization factor for the degree in, before the parameter. Then up to scalar, such kind of uh, hypersurface has a holomorphic differential a minus two form. It admits the action on the surface, there is the action of this abelian group that inside each of the variable, you can put together some primitive nth root raised to different powers. But the condition will be when you get to the last one, when you get to the last one, they should be put up together to be invariant. So that's the condition to make sure you add the primitive nth root, but the last term is also invariant. And you can compute the pick foods equation, as what I mentioned for the quintic case, it's a very special form down here. Right. It's defined over Q and the parameter sets one over the degree, two over the degree, etc. And you can do that by using, again, GKC method. Right. And for this talk, we are more interesting. How about the point counts on the Dewalt family? And the answer has been given earlier by Koblitz. And then later, there is also another paper by John Mark McCarthy on point counts on the Dewalt family. And I would like to show you some of the things because I want to actually tell you all the period function or the finite field hypergeometric functions are very natural. So let me show you why they are very natural definition. So we get to this formulation and the example over here, I'm get to the elliptic curve case. So it's also known as the Hesse pencil. And the elliptic curve now is going to be the Fermat tie, okay, variable to the Q power and subtracting the diagonal term. The parameter is here with a normalizing factor. And there is also a highlight lambda. Lambda later will be psi to the minus three power. And we consider, of course, for fixed this psi over here, I get elliptic curve. If I write carefully some of the singular points, including kind of one. And 
So if I fix the sign, I get a particular elliptic curve. I call this kind of polynomial, which is homogeneous polynomial to be f of, I use x bar to denote x0, x1, x2, and then depend on this sign. Okay. I would like to mention that actually in the mirror symmetry, what they're actually referring to will be the original family more out by the abelian group, which it will be you inserting QB root here, here, and here, but make sure they're compatible. All right. The quotient basically referring to the following map, which is a morphism from the this uh, the work family down to the model I have mentioned earlier using uh, Boyker's uh, Cohen and Manet. Very explicitly, you can see that I will turn this guy into my x1, this guy turn to my y1, this guy turn to my y2, etc. Then this is a natural homomorphism. Of course, this is unfortunately is not a birational map. Otherwise, I know the point counts right away. <laughs> they will be much easier. But now let's do the point count. I want to show you first how to do the trivial point count. It's relating to a topic <coughs> which is called a formal group law. So let me first do the trivial point count, which is I'm going to count, I'm assuming P to be bigger than three and the parameter to be inside finite field. And I'm going to do the point count, which is over a finite field. And I'm going to do it the final counts module P. The idea is back into for elliptic curve, more or less the hazard invariant. So the conclusion will be the point count is going to be the hypergeometric function Lambda is again to be side to the minus three. And I'm doing the truncation. I only stop, I go up from zero to P minus one, then I stop. It's a truncated sum over here. So it's going to be a finite sum, and then the value will agree modulo P. Right? And the way to do it is the standard way. It's well, I start with this polynomial, which is degree three. And then using Fermat little, the when I plug all the value in, I get a number in my finite field raised to p minus power. It's either one or zero. Okay. So that actually gives me a way to do the delta function, do the counts, how many solutions. So basically, to do the counts, I'm going to sum over all the delta value. So it's one minus the polynomial raised to p minus one's power. And of course, the major term will be p to the three. There will be kind of the other terms. But if you look at the other terms using more or less the orthogonal property, if you're summing over all the arriving kind of all the components, which will be monomials, degree and most, 3p minus three, most of them, the sum will give you zero, except when you hit to this combination, all right? When you hit to this combination, it will be minus one. There is a minus sign, modulo p, this y, this disappear. So it boils down to computing what is the coefficient of my degree three polynomial raised to p minus one's power for the coefficient, for the coefficient of this particular monomial. And then everything turned to its uh, combinatorial count, right? So it will be this particular kind of choices. Putting together, this is the count over here. What I want to mention over here, it's again by refreshing formula. <laughs> this my binomial coefficient is going to be the same as this value. 3i factorial over i factorial to the 3 power. And then it's actually going from 0 to p minus 1 over 3. I mean, this may not be integer, but you can do the flow function over here. It will be the same as this truncated hypergeometric function modulo p, because the later term a priori will be divisible by p beyond this flow function. And I want to mention that because <laughs> I call it a formal group detour. <laughs> right? And if you generalize the idea that mentioned, got mentioned in the previous page, there is a theory called commutative formal group law, which apply. I mean, there is a general theory for kind of uh, 
algebraic varieties just like that, any of the Dewalt family. So there's a formula, there's a theorem by Yang Stingshi. Applying his formula to the current case, basically what he tells you is, the formal part is, what I'm going to compute will be some numbers, B. Right. The numbers are coming from coefficients of x, y raised to subscript minus 1 of the same cubic polynomial raised to the same power. All right. Of course, this is a combinatorial number. Okay, then formally, I put them together into a formal logarithm. So numbers computed very combinatorially put together into a formal power series tau to the m over m, all right? So this is the formal part. And then what? <laughs> it said that if you continue, you can build a group law. <laughs> it's a formal group law. And they use two variables, u and v. You have two of those formal power series. You add them together. You take the formal inverse of this function and then you combine them together, what you will see is the major term will be u plus v, plus higher terms involving u and v. The amazing thing will be if I start with p to be bigger than 3, psi to be zp, everything is kind of, it's a, the difficult part will be L inverse. It's going to be periodically integral. And this is a group law. It's indeed a group law. It's actually reproducing the group law of elliptic curve, the addition of this elliptic curve near infinity. All right. So it's a commutative because we are facing elliptic curve group law written in a very formal way. And what's that for? Then Stinscher tells you that hmm, once you have a formal group law, you have so-called the Aiken and Sutendaya conferences. So what's the particular Swinton Atkins Swinton diaconferences, ASD conferences? For the particular case, you still have the same combinatorial number. And if you put together this AP, all right, what's this AP? This AP will be the number of points on the elliptic curve, and then you take away, I think I skipped that, all right, this is the, the typical arrow turn count for the elliptic curve, all right, so I might, Kind of, it's the p plus one take away number of points on the Hassa curve over FP. All right, I'm counting infinity here as well. So this is my AP. Right. And then plus p, if you put them together, you let there are two freedom. One, it will be the m, there is a multiple. There is also the power p can go up, right? So the power p can go up. And if you let the MR go from one to infinity, this combination will give you a higher and higher power of P, which is called the ASD conferences. All right. So it's actually kind of amazing kind of story that when you put things all together, then you can interpret um, from the point count, you get to more or less what I'm trying to tell you is from the point count, naively you start from the point count over FP, then you can get to more or less theta function from the elliptic curve coming from the H1. Okay, and then back to the point count. <laughs> now I'm going to do a more precise count. All right, <laughs> the naive count is good, <laughs> and then let's get to the more precise count. Let's get back to um hypergeometric functions over finite fields. To get to a more precise count, what we're going to do is, this is the polynomial I'm going to put into here. And before we do the count using delta function, delta function is not convenient to use. So I'm going to modify by using the additive character. So insert additional variable v, let v going over all the finite field values, so if the value is zero, then the average will give me, it's going to be Q. If the combination is not zero, then the average will be zero. So that's playing the role of delta function with this normalization. We are seeing more or less the delta function is replaced by some mention 
v over final fill, 1 over v, and then there's the additive character, and v, and then f of x sign over here. And then the q minus 1 is to make sure I'm going from going to the projective variety. And the funny thing is, it's individual if you count that it's not easy, but it's actually easier if you put into a family. So I let the parameter vary over all points on my finite field, I get a function. Why it's easier than when we have Fourier, finite Fourier analysis, all right? And the main point is we're gonna to get to Gaussian from this business, all right? So let's compute the inner product. We consider what's the, in the finite Fourier analysis, the important thing will be the coefficient, the inner product. So let's kind of doing the way that with the Q minus one over here, so it's directly, it's a sum, all right? And the very first step, if you put the additive multiplicative character in, all right, this is what you want to compute the inner product. And then when you put that in, you want to create a Gauss sum. In order to create a Gauss sum, I'm going to add the tail, and then I put the tail, put the correction back, all right? So I'm going to modify this term down to this term in order to create a Gauss sum. And with the tail, then we're going to write things down. The inner product, the coefficient is going to be, there is a Gaussian. And then there is additional term coming in. This additional term, if we call it S of chi, and because of the symmetry in the writing, when chi is not a cubic character, I can replace my X1 by a cubic root times Zeta three times X, we will see that we're going to get zero. So this value is zero if chi is not a cubic character. So let's continue to assume that we are only worrying about my character being a cubic character. All right. So the, the corresponding kind of S chi value becoming this particular sum over here. There are some standard business we will do for how to compute a formal sum of this kind, we change variable to u, and this value over here will depending on uh, whether this, uh, so it will depends on whether this is u to be a q power, so it's a standard computation in character sum, you can write it down, right? So I want to show you in the end, if you put things together, they group together into different Gauss sums, right? That's what I want to show you in the end of the computation, if you put things together in the way, and you will see again, you will hit the HQ function. All right. The HQ function will appear again. And the spirit I want to convey will be, if you start with a variety, now it's more classical, it's a deformed Fermat type. The pickup foot is hypergeometric. The character sum, the major part, is the finite hypergeometric character sum as well. Okay. I think I forget another negative side here as well. All right. Any <laughs> questions? So basically, uh, what we have got to in the computation I've done earlier, it's what is for the elliptic curve. But for the um, the walk family, you can do things which is more in the inches of uh, physicists. It's the club Yao threefold, all right? So for the, the walk quintic case, they play a special role in mirror symmetry because a lot of computation have been done first for the, the walk quintic family. And so it's given by this particular formula. There are a lot of symmetries. When you compute the corresponding arch diamond, right? So if you compute the Hodge diamond for the Dewalt printed, the numbers actually, it's going to be one here, it's going to be 101 here, it's going to be 101, it's going to be one down here. So if I'm going to compute the interesting, as what Bill mentioned, the middle cohomology, it's going to be big. And in physics, they have an idea which is called the mirror. All right, the mirror symmetry in the 
in the context that I want under, understand better is so called the arithmetic mirror will be start from the the walk quintic you move out by the symmetry group that I mentioned, which will be inserting primitive fifth row here, here, and here, and then make sure they're compatible. If you move out the corresponding automorphism group, you get to a orbifold, and then you carefully smooth out the orbifold, you get to its mirror. The mirror more or less is very relating to the formulation by Boykus, Cohen, and Mennett. And amazingly, the mirror symmetry says between V and its mirror, what happened is the mirror is actually occurring on this diagonal line. Okay, that means if I go to the hash numbers for the mirror, I will get to still, I flip across, I still get one, zero, zero, one. I still get zero here, but this number bump into 101 for the, I mean, the walk quintic, and then this is zero. And luckily this number becomes one, 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 and zero, one, oh, one, and zero. And then this is zero, zero, and one. And the good news to us is, wow, then this X3 is much smaller. It's easier to handle, <laughs> right? So, and the, in the background, it's actually relating to two kind of algebraic varieties that I mentioned. On this side is the the Watt family, and this hand side is the Boykers Cohen kind of variety. Right. And if we now look at the mirrors X3, generically, what we're going to get, say, if we compute the etalco homology, it's going to be four dimensional. If I get to the corresponding uh, etalco homology, it's four dimensional. However, when we specialize the fiber to be very particular choices, including all the cases, all the, say, fifth group of unity, all of a sudden, this number dropped down to zero. So the middle cohomology dropped down to one zero zero one, which is even better for us. Because when you jump down to two dimensional kind of cohomology, if you compute the Galois representation, say if this side to be one, you have a model which is defined over Q. So it gets to the modularity of rigid club beyond manifold defined over Q. Okay. So this is actually for the quintic case. It's uh, first proved by Chet Song that when psi equals to one, there is an explicit level 25 wave four modular form whose point counts coincide with the major point, the major part of the point count over finite fields. And for the general case, this is the theorem due to Dulafay and Gouveia and Yuri. It says that if you have any rigid, rigid means H2, 1, and H1, 2 will be 0. If you have a rigid club BL manifold defined over Q, and therefore any prime L which you fixed, there is a wave for modular form whose integer coefficient, with integer coefficient, so that the L at the Galois representation arriving from the circle homology group of X is isomorphic to that representation coming out from the corresponding waveform modular form. Right. So get to more about modularity later. Another thing I want to mention is now going back to the quintic case, the corresponding one of the defining, uh, one of the pick up equation is this one over here, which is the degree four. Again, the theta is going to be Lambda d d lambda, and it has a unique up to scalar solution near zero, which is the hypergeometric function for F three. And altogether, there are some conditions for so called the Club Yao differential equation. That means that Pickup's equation will satisfy by one parameter family of Club Yao varieties. 
And there are 14 such kind of clavial differential equations which are hypergeometric. So there is a classification um, by this uh, four people over here, Alchemist, Wang and Colbert, Wang Jarton, and Vadim Sudley. Okay, so they actually write down the 14 list. They are of the form that all lower parameters are one. And the upper parameters will be somehow all the possibilities you can put down to be some rational numbers, one minus that, another rational number, and one minus that. And if I want the condition to be everything defined over Q, I would like the denominator to be either Euler number to be one or two or four. So altogether, there are 14 cases. And going too fast. And for each of those, we can write down the corresponding Calabria 3, 4. I saw you two in the, one of the slides before. I saw you the two for uh, one FIPS, two FIPS, which is in terms of the walk quintic. I also saw you the case for one third, one third, which is in terms of a complete intersection. And in particular, when the parameter is one, they all correspond to rigid labial threefold. So according to the modularity theorem, then we know they are modular. So tomorrow I'm going to tell you how we can identify the corresponding wave four modular forms. Okay. So the takeaway I want to say is basically hypergeometric function over finite field can be studied or can be understood in a way which is parallel to the classical setting. There are horizontal and vertical ways to consider them. I will say more about the horizontal way tomorrow. And they are very useful for point counts, especially for one parameter family of varieties whose pickup equations are hypergeometric. I think the basic reason is the rigidity. Once you have actually a variational structure, which is kind of um, kind of controlled by the differential equation, if it's hypergeometric, then the rigidity will play an important role. Okay? And some of these varieties are important in the development of mirror symmetries in, in string theory. In return, the notation of this mirror actually gives us connections between two types of hypergeometric varieties. One is the Dewalk type, the other will be the BCM type. All right. With that said, I think I finish today's lecture and thank you. Thank you.